A warning to our listeners, this podcast contains discussions about suicide and violence. Please take care of yourself and take advantage of the resources we note at the end of our episode if you need them. A heated meeting for parents all over bathrooms. I'm concerned for the safety of my daughter. It will affirm to all of the trans and gender nonconforming students that they matter. Identities don't play sports. Bodies do. The physiologically weaker sex will lose the ability to compete. Equity-based curriculums around race, gender, sexualities open the door for conversations that help to prevent, address, and mitigate microaggressions. School board, I quit. I quit your policies, I quit your trainings, and I quit being a cog in a machine that tells me to push highly politicized agendas on our most vulnerable constituents. There's no scarcity of impediments facing LGBTQ kids. Bills from Oklahoma to Ohio would ban trans student athletes from competing, dictate pupils' choices on which bathrooms that they can use, limit the books that they can read in class, or check out in the school library. A vocal minority insists that discussions about gay and trans issues should be off limits in schools at a time when mental health experts say kids need them most. Because here's what we know about gay and trans youth. Those who openly identify as LGBTQ make up about 10% of the 13 to 24 year old population. In Ohio schools, 72% of gay and trans students were verbally harassed in 2020. And between 10 and 11% were assaulted because of their sexual orientation or sexual identities. The most sobering statistic? LGBTQ youth are four times more likely than their peers to attempt suicide. In the United States, a queer or trans youth attempts to end their life every 45 seconds. Professor Colette Dollarhide, who has trained hundreds of school counselors at Ohio State over the last 15 years, says this. Young people who are sexually non-traditional, either in terms of sexual identity, in terms of sexual orientation, those young people are at tremendous risk for suicidal ideation and are victims of hate crimes in far greater proportion than any other group. All of which should hit very close to home when your child, or your student, is the one who comes to you saying, I'm gay, or I'm non-binary. In that moment, how do you respond? Because given the hostile social and political environment toward LGBTQ young people, that response, especially from parents, will follow them for the rest of their lives. Don't believe it? Keep listening to what queer and trans high school students said about parents during a research study by Professor Molly Blackburn. Their response might surprise you as much as it did her. This is the Ohio State University Inspire podcast, a production of the College of Education and Human Ecology. I'm Robin Chenoweth. Carol Del Grosso is our audio engineer. Kyle Bucklew is our student intern. When Professor Molly Blackburn began working with teachers to combat homophobia through literature, she and fellow researchers came upon a roadblock. Some of the teachers in that teacher inquiry group, which was called the Pink Tigers, would say, well, uh, well, we can't read queer inclusive literature in our classrooms. That was in 2004. Those sentiments have only intensified. As school board meetings flare over curriculum choices, just over half of teachers recently polled by Education Week believe that they should teach LGBTQ topics. A primary reason? They fear pushback from parents, and they worry that they'll get it, quote, wrong. But whatever you believe, there is value gained from knowing what happens when teachers do teach those themes in schools. That's what happened in 2015, when Blackburn was given an extraordinary opportunity. There was a school in town that had really actively started working to include and make positive space for LGBTQ youth. And I started imagining the possibility of being able to teach an LGBTQ literature class in that school. And that was something I don't think when I started my academic work, it's not something I imagined possible. Being a researcher, she offered to teach the literature class for free if she could collect qualitative data. The school agreed, obtained parental permissions, and Blackburn set up her first of three classes. 
At first, mostly white students signed up. Over time, the class became more diverse. The books and passages Blackburn offered weren't overtly sexual in nature. They simply included LGBTQ characters trying to find acceptance. And during the class discussions, something telling happened. As a teacher, I think I learned a lot about kind of being quiet and listening and making space for students to talk about what they needed to talk about. The book discussions could be intense, such as those about a graphic novel whose protagonist comes out to her parents. When the father kind of doesn't let the daughter talk about being gay, he cuts her off at multiple times. That was a time when I mean, kids were furious with him. Like, what do they want? What does he want? What does he expect? Like, like the, just the passion toward the parents was, I just hadn't predicted it. But Blackburn also discovered in those discussion circles great tenderness toward family members. I was interested by how much they talked about family and religion. And, you know, when I look back about it, that shouldn't be a big surprise to me. But it wasn't what I planned for. it. Family and religion. That is what they wanted to talk about, and they talked about it with such um, love and compassion toward people who had, in some ways, made their lives really much more difficult. Really? That surprises me. Yeah, it surprised me, too. The amount of work that they would do to try to understand their family members, particularly their parents, was just stunning. One student kept referring back to her own experience of coming out to her family deepening her understanding of her mother by reflecting on book passages she had read about a trans teen. She had heard her mother say, you have to understand that when you were born, I imagined a certain future for you, and I, I have to give that future up in order to imagine the future that you are, you know, pursuing. Um, and she was like, and so I, I love you, but it, but it's a shift for me. It's hard for me. I don't know what she said to her mom, but it, but in our class, she was very receptive to that argument. Not everyone was, but she was. And um, it helped her to understand the moms in the book. Like it seemed to be this back and forth that, where the kid could understand her mom better and then could understand the characters better. The passages she was reading helped heal the schism that coming out created between her and her mom. That's what Blackburn calls deeply ethical movement. Not ethical in a puritanical sense, but the notion of shifting one's understanding to encompass another person, even when that person had hurt them. Parents can make ethical movement, too. If these observations don't already make it obvious, LGBTQ kids crave acceptance, especially from their parents. Though their conversations at home might have sounded very different, in the open and inclusive classroom setting, these youth disclosed their truest longing. They would identify characters in stories where the parents had really done right by their kid, and they would say, this is my favorite part of the book. Even if it wasn't like an integral part of the storyline, but that was their favorite part of the book. Providing those encounters to kids who are facing rejection elsewhere opens a door to belonging a critical lifeline for some LGBTQ youth. 50 years ago, educators talked for the first time about representation of black characters in children's literature so that children of color can see themselves as viable members of their communities. Blackburn Scholarship seeks to do the same for queer and trans kids. Her book on the study, Moving Across Differences, how Students Engage LGBTQ Plus Themes in a High School Literature Class is set to publish in September. Blackburn's observation on LGBTQ youth and families perfectly align with what mental health and counseling experts know about belonging and acceptance. Human connection and authentic relationship and acceptance is kind of an innate human need that we all have. Clinical Associate Professor Ashley Hicks directs the Couple and Family Therapy Clinic at Ohio State University. 
We think about this early on. We find that infants need the connection with their primary caregiver to learn about the world, about themselves, to learn that the world is a safe place that they can trust. We don't lose that as we get older. And oftentimes as we get older and we're figuring out who we are and what this world is about, not having a safe place or supportive place um, can cause us significant distress. Our brain experiences emotional pain in the same way that it experienced physical pain. And so a rejection Although it's an emotional experience, our brain is telling us that we are in the physical pain and turmoil. And that really weighs on, on us um, when we're, we're thinking about young people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, non-binary, um, queer that when they don't have someone who is supporting them or accepting of them or they feel like they have to hide who they are, that causes a significant amount of stress that could lead to depression, anxiety, suicidality. Colette Dollarhide has counseled students and families on what it means to come out. Those encounters go well about half the time. We're born with an innate sense of how we want to function in the world. And that sense of how we function is deeply rooted and is integral to how we see ourselves as human beings. These identities are things that are present in a person's life, in their psyche, from birth. So this is not something that people get and suddenly wake up one morning and go, oh, I think that I'm actually a male in a female body. They are aware all their lives that something is different about the way that they view the world. They're aware that they're out of step with their colleagues, with their siblings, with their friends at school. And these feelings of difference come to a crisis point at various points in their lives. One of the really profound opportunities to reflect on this issue is Star House that uh, Dr. Natasha Slesnik founded and worked so hard to support. Star House is a drop-in center in Columbus, Ohio, which served nearly 900 homeless youth ages 14 to 24 in 2020. Star House is primarily peopled with homeless young people whose parents have not been able to accept their sexual identities. There are other reasons, but primarily there are a tremendous number of young people who, because of their sexual identity, are no longer welcome in their parents' home. And that is such a tragedy that we are willing to throw away young people because they don't fit the ideas of the prevailing society about what a, a young person should be. That to me is tragic. That's just unutterably tragic. Associate Professor Keisha Radliff studies bullying in schools and helps train school psychologists who, along with the school counselors, can be among the first adults LGBTQ kids turn to, especially if they fear their parents' response. When we look at our homeless population, a lot of times it's LGBTQ youth who have been kicked out of the house because of who they are. Having children myself, I can't fathom it. I can understand if families haven't thought about that at all, and then it's a, a shock and they have a very poor reaction. If they're able to sit with it and understand who their child is and recognize their or their child and love them and, and support them, I think that can make a huge difference for their child. But even for children facing milder rejection, consequences are significant. When you think about it, this is their home, their space, and if they're not welcome, validated, seen for who they are, that's really hard. Where do you go? And then if school is in a safe space, so if families can think about the bigger picture, do I truly love my child no matter who they are or for who they are, as they are? I think that's really critical. Something else to consider. All the media coverage and ramped up rhetoric at school board meetings can come back on LGBTQ students inside schools. Not only are kids feeling rejection at home, after years of finding more acceptance among their peers, they are now increasingly coming under attack in some schools. What did you think was going to happen when you pushed porn into the classrooms and, and into the libraries and let boys into the girls' bathrooms? The idea that my daughters need to be protected from transgender athletes competing or from using the same bathroom is based in misogyny and antiquated ideas from the last century. I'm a teacher, but I serve God first, and I will not affirm that a biological boy can be a girl and vice versa, because it's against my religion, it's lying to a child, it's abuse to a child, and it's sinning against our God. 30 states are now considering bills that ban 
sexually confused boys from competing in girls' sports. Pens Order, please. The whole feeling of being targeted, I don't know if kids are paying attention to what's in the news right now. Maybe you have to be looking for it, but it's really right here in Ohio, too. That's making headlines. Do you think that might cause more bullying? Certainly, I think that can contribute to bullying because if the adults are saying this is something that's not appropriate or something unwelcome, um, that message trickles down to children. We've seen that in other areas and other political issues that have come up where that comes into the schools and the message kids repeat the things that they're hearing at home. So certainly, and we've seen the increase in bullying over the last few years as well amongst LGBTQ students as targets. Now more than ever, LGBTQ youth need support. And the best place for that to start is at home. Back to our original question, we asked Colette Dollarhide, a counselor expert, when a kid comes out, what should you say? Let's start with a few things not to say. Um, a parent might say, oh, I knew it all along. That's an interesting comment. Frequently, parents do have an innate understanding that their student holds identities that are sexually non-traditional, especially if it's said in a loving context. Those words can help a student understand that it is innate. It, is, it isn't something shameful or horrible. If it's said in a negative way, however, it's a pity because what that does is it, it discounts the child's entire relationship with that parent, that somehow I knew you were always sub or inadequate or not what I wanted. How about this one? This is just a phase. That is also problematic. Sexual identity is not something that people outgrow. It is not something that people change over time. It is an integral part of who that human being is. So to discount it and make it sound like, oh, you'll outgrow this, this is immaturity, that is a, unfortunately a very damaging way to react to a young person. It's up to the adult to be able to listen and to be able to ask questions in order to understand what the motivation for the statement, where that's coming from, rather than just attributing it to, oh, you're immature, oh, you'll grow out of it, because that discounts that young person's identity. I know that sometimes parents find themselves religiously opposed to the news that their kids are giving them. So how about God doesn't want you to be gay? I've always understood God in a very different way, that God does not make imperfect people, that we are all perfect in God's eyes. That last one breaks my heart. If a parent is unable to appreciate and love that child, that young person, for exactly who they are, all that they are, then that to me is a flawed parent. I'm sorry. <laughs> that to me is a flawed parent. If that is the, the religious perspective that a parent holds, then that is very sad because that would suggest that that's a toxic relationship between that parent and that child. If I'm not okay who I am to someone that says they love me, then they can't love me. That isn't love, in my opinion. In a clinical context, in all my years of working with young people and all my years of training counselors, I would recommend that someone who is in a toxic relationship be very thoughtful and very intentional about when and how they engage that person because that person is not holding my benefit foremost in their love. If on the other hand, the message is you're okay just the way you are, you're perfect just the way you are, you are loved just the way you are, you are respected, you are valued, then young people are gonna be more likely to be free to express who they are. Whether that is in terms of traditional gender identities or non-traditional gender identities. Especially in today's politically charged climate, schools must stand as allies for LGBTQ students, experts say. And they must do a better job. 
A 2019 National School Climate Survey by GLSEN showed that only 7% of students identifying as LGBTQ attend schools with a comprehensive anti-bullying harassment policy specific to sexual orientation and gender expression. Only 7% attended schools with guidelines that support transgender and non-binary students. In those schools that did, LGBTQ students had more positive experiences, missed school less, and were less often victims of harassment and violence. Keisha Radliff. When you're not represented, it's like you don't exist. And so it, it kind of communicates a message of your experience and your voice is not important. And so we're not representing it. Also, the message that there's something wrong with it, which is why we can't talk about it in schools. It can be very harmful and lead to internalizing the issues. So feelings of anxiety, like I'm not welcome here. Something we talk about as school psychologists is when we have our resources in our office, who's represented in those resources? So the books that we have, the posters we have, things that we talk about, how are we demonstrating that this is a safe space for LGBTQ youth? Staff can have stickers or posters, things that identify that they are an ally their space, their office, their classroom is a safe space for LGBTQ youth. I think that's really important. You can certainly say it, but if you have that signal and someone sees that, they know that is a place I can go where I will be safe. Genders and sexuality alliances, once known as gay-straight alliances, have been shown in multiple studies to reduce suicide risk and violence against queer students. These are great organizations that help to build community amongst our LGBTQ youth in schools. And I think it's great when staff are involved so that students know individuals who are safe people to talk to and, and supports that they have um, within their schools. Colette Dollarhide talks about training school counselors to advocate for each student's unique diversity constellation. It's so important that the adults who surround our young people are understanding of LGBTQ plus issues and are able to understand that all of this is fluid. All of this is incredibly personal. It is a challenge for young people to feel comfortable to talk to someone about it, and especially to talk to adults who are in positions of authority or adults who are in positions of judgment. And teachers, counselors, parents certainly can send affirming messages and understanding messages about the variety of different ways that people encounter truth in their lives and give young people the opportunity to talk about these questions so that that pain and those internalized messages of inadequacy are not the source for suicidal activity. My granddaughter has come out as bisexual and she did this with a cake and said, this is my coming out day. And we had a party, we celebrated with her. I would encourage anyone who has someone come out to them that they express delight, that the person trusts them enough to be honest with them about who they are. And that in that conversation, they are able to say, you matter to me exactly as you are, all that you are, all that you'll ever be, all that you've ever been, that you are important and that this is a wonderful statement of your trust of me. The research, the counseling, all the interactions that LGBTQ kids have had over the years Prove it. There is power in the response to kids coming out as LGBTQ. The question is, will it be power that embraces them, loves them, hopes for them, or will it be power that pushes them away? For resources on how to become an ally or to speak to a counselor, visit the Trevor Project website at thetrevorproject.org. Also, the OSU Couple and Family Therapy Clinic will offer virtual six-week LGBTQ family support groups beginning February 3rd. Email cftclinic at osu.edu or call 614-292-3671.